Hello and welcome to another episode of the MXGP podcast show on Vital MX. No guest this week. I know we teased Jeffrey Hurlings. So like unwrapping the most underwhelming gift ever on Christmas Day, you just have myself, Lewis Phillips, and Adam Wheeler from the Paddock Pass podcast. Uh, scheduling conflicts this week mean no guest. We will pick up guests in the future. This is a one-off. Do not lose faith in us. Um... Thank you. No, too. no, no, no. Hang on. No, 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 no. First, there's your issue with giving Christmas gifts anyway. So purely by the fact that we don't have a guest, that's probably a good thing. Yep. And secondly, whose responsibility was it to get Jeffrey Hurlings on the show this week? Well, I listened to your Paddock Pass podcast on YouTube and I heard about your your travel plans for this weekend. So already I knew that our scheduled time wasn't going to work. Oh, we're playing blame tennis now. Are so we? then okay. I was like, well, hang on. I don't like our scheduled time is not going to work. So we're going to have to be flexible with this. And then I was like, well, if we add a third person into that game, it's only going to be even more difficult. So I played the smart move. And also it's 9 a.m. European time, midnight where I am. Just I don't want credit. I just want applause. Um, it's 9 a.m. in Europe. So everyone's riding. Right. Well, we were going to record this for my evening and for your morning, which would have been better for any riders because they're not going to be riding at sort of 9 p.m., Lewis. So there you go. I'm hitting this back over the net. Little nice little drop shot. I don't think you're going to reach it, though. So um, I think the next Grand Prix next weekend, you're going to have to um, serve up something pretty good. Well, Jeffrey will be next. If not Jeffrey Rasmus, that's my uh, uh, yeah Rasmus Jorgensen, the you know the team manager of the Husqvarna MX2 team. I mean, very very timely to get him on the podcast. Of his riders uh, now gone three for three. Uh, I don't think getting Jeffrey on after the next Grand Prix in Arco would be such a great idea. I don't think it's probably it probably ranks as one of his favourite tracks. Okay, great segue. Also, thank you to Polisport, All Balls Racing Group, and EVS for their support of this podcast. Great segue. So. This is somewhat reminiscent to 2017, when Jeffrey made his debut uh, in the 450 class, struggled to find his feet initially after an injury. Uh, it slowly started to turn around. The turning point was Trentino, of all places. Second moto, he finished fourth. Uh, from memory, I think he went 15-4 or something ridiculous that day. Hard to believe now, uh, people who were not following MXGP back then but Hurlings was so bad at the start of um, 2017 he was literally a 13th place rider and he even started to doubt himself because I distinctly remember interviewing him in Leon, Mexico and I asked a very standard question and he just spewed his guts with like maybe this isn't for me we've seen so many riders who are great 250 riders and it doesn't translate to the 450 class that might just be me like you could tell there was a crisis going on. Um, two things there. Uh, 2017, when he was riding the 450 the first time, I think he had a broken hand coming into the season. And the second thing is, uh, at some point, quite soon, I think after that sort of interview, he admitted he had made a big miscalculation when it comes to his training and his prep, and he assumed that he'd just be able to roll his 250 speed and dominance into the Premier class. And he said, I underestimated things. So it's... Uh, you know, it wasn't the, the best preparation, but by the mid part of 2017, he was really on the hunt, wasn't he? I think it was only a technical problem in Sweden that sort of derailed his march up the championship standings and ultimately gave Tony Cairoli the impetus to, you know, lock in that last world title. Yeah, speaking of derailed, I think it was a derailed chain in Sweden. And yeah, yeah. like um, forgotten history often overlooked, Hurlings was probably going to win that title if not for that issue. And it unbelievable because I don't know exactly, but he was so, so, so far behind in the points. Again, somewhat relevant to this season. Maybe it's not all over yet. Um, but before we talk about Hurlings more, we should probably give apt credit to the man who I will echo exactly what I said after Spain. Jorge Prado is incredible, amazing. I cannot believe the level he has risen to. He was already amazing. Who knew it was possible to become more amazing, etc., etc., etc. This is unbelievable. He's won every race, qualifying race or moto, since Argentina. Um, statement made. Yeah, absolutely. And especially in the terrain in Rio de Sardo, I mean, I think it was Tim Geiger that said that this track ranked as one of the hardest on the calendar. 
And Prada seems to have that extra level of fitness that people were criticizing him for last season, where he was winning a lot of first motos, but then not following up in the second. There was a moment, Lewis, um, you know, where it was great for the sort of TV viewers, like, like you and I, um, in the second motor when Jeffrey Herlings was closing in on him, there was a sense that Herlings was overriding to a degree, and he admitted that afterwards. Uh, and that sort of led to his, his crash, where the, the front just dipped into a hole and he was down. But yeah, Prado, I, I would be, it would have been fascinating to see if he could have repelled that sort of attack from, her, um, from Herlings and stretched out his lead again, because uh, he's been not only been in control of this championship, but every single Grand Prix situation so far. What do we make of his comments post-race? Because I know they, um, they stirred up some people, definitely worth some discussion. Uh, when I heard them, I was like, oh, okay. Um, Prado, Prado's never been one to shy away from... Uh, con not controversy. What would you call it? Very forward so, comments. Like he doesn't yeah, stoke stoking the fire a little bit. Yeah, that's a better way to put it. He doesn't. He's not one to just sort of like sit in the background and um keep the peace. If he's got something on his mind, he'll say it. Um, and that was a striking comment. And then he he um the comment, of course, if you didn't see it, was something along the lines of. I wanted to see if Jeffrey could keep the pace with me, and he couldn't. It was that blunt. Um, there was no mention of his crash. There was no mention of his mistake. It was, to someone who hadn't watched the race, it was as if he had just dropped dropped Jeffrey um, through pure speed and aggression. And then he followed that up with some comment about, I guess you can call me the Sandman now, which was again, oh, <laughs> we're, we're some, the second uh bullets fired so yeah i don't well, know maybe yeah. too early for that i don't know yeah i mean i think uh, i would file the comment as cheeky rather than anything deliberately provocative and you know because he's he knows where hurlings is coming from i mean he's not sort of taking on a rider who's just dominated a championship or been as competitive as he was in 2021 but there were also some comments in 2022 when you know prado was saying i'm developing this bike and i'm the only one as if to sort of point the finger at Hurlings and say, you know, he's made another mistake, he's injured again. You know, I'm doing the bulk of the development work on the 450. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, Jorge does like to remind people of sort of, um, or maybe it's even a barb at KTM to a degree. You know, I'm your leading guy. I'm, I'm your number one. Uh, and, you know, you put a lot of faith, maybe a lot of money um, in Jeffrey Hurlings, but, you know, I'm the one that's here winning the races and, and doing the donkey work. And uh, at the moment, Lewis, I mean, he's just looking an absolute shoe in for the title because, you know, the points gap is already quite substantial. And, you know, he can at some point go into championship mode. I mean, we're only after uh, round three and we're going to go to round four next weekend. It's, uh, it's it's looking pretty locked in for sort of Jorge. I mean, it's a ridiculous thing to say. He's only a broken collarbone or a broken wrist away from losing any kind of points advantage. But, you know, Prado just has that, fantastic Tony Cairoli mode of sort of slipping into a 60, 70% riding rate and not really taking any big risks. And when you can start like that, then it makes the job that much easier. And um, worth mentioning that he did actually hurt his ankle on Saturday, uh, crashed in free practice. That was a twisted ankle, I believe. Obviously, it didn't hold him back at all. And he even admitted that it didn't hold him back when riding. But proof that stuff can happen. And to that point, uh, Hurlings injured his ribs on Saturday as well. So yeah, stuff is happening. Ribs. I think he had to have a scan, didn't he? Uh, he said he had a scan and there was no fractures, but then he said he needed painkillers for the first moto. Uh, I mean, it left, the medication left him feeling a bit dizzy, so he didn't take any for the second race. Um, but yeah, it wasn't a best situation for Hurlings, but that's also another good first, I guess you could say, that you know he's had a crash, he's had a, a physical issue, and um, it hasn't really sort of left any big sort of mark on him. I think you have to look at Tim Geiser, though, because uh, you know he's the rider that stands the best chance of really closing down this threat of Jorge Prado at the moment. I mean, we can talk about Roman Febra's Grand Prix, but because I thought he rode you know, really well, but uh, Geiser is um, sort of quietly going about his work although there was one comment lewis afterwards from the honda man where he said that uh something about he couldn't push like he wanted or something like that you know which makes me think that he you know everything's still not sort of completely well with the race bike in that sort of hrc setup yet yeah which is tim's not really that guy um from memory i cannot remember a comment 
of his but blamed bike setup or an exterior factor for him struggling. So I'd be quite surprised if he um, if he was going that way about it. But I would I will say his body language after the race, I felt like that was a more defeated geyser than I've seen. I don't really feel like I've seen that much. Like there was almost an air of and maybe it was just um hot day, deep sand left a lot on yeah. the track but it did see i just felt like there was a little underlying tone of shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it was very freaky conditions i mean it's fantastic spring weather in europe for that grand prix but uh, i think i mean guys is one of those people that usually stands on the podium it looks like he can do another two motos doesn't he i mean he rarely looks sort of tired or exhausted or whatever so i, I agree with you there was some of that sort of demeanor uh, post race on sunday but yeah, he did look like he wasn't, you know, so comfortable on the bike or was fighting it to a degree. And it was just, maybe it's just a sand setup. We don't know. It's the first time you can call Argentina a little bit loose and sandy, but this was the first big kind of sand race of the calendar. And it didn't seem to go too well for him because he didn't have any answer to, to Prado. But then a 2-2 is, you know, that, that kind of consistency that he needs to keep in the, in the chase. I do want to make this clear to everyone. Uh, obviously, Jeffrey is the shoe-in in the sand, more often than not. Uh, World-renowned for his sand skills. We all know how amazing he is, blah, blah, blah. But Prado is very close to Jeffrey. Like, if you're ranking sand skills, Prado is not in the same category as Tim and Roman. So I feel like a lot of people are shocked that Prado did this in the sand and like, oh, what a statement for him to win in the sand. But no, he is... Um, if you're going to bet on anyone to beat Jeffrey in the sand, it would be Prado going away. So I feel yeah. like it's important to get that across. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I think also um, Paul Malin and Jason Thomas, who we can talk about a bit later in the podcast, but on the commentary, uh, Paul was mentioning that, you know, Jorge Prado moved to Belgium when he was young. His whole family went from um, northwest Spain to Belgium when he was 12 years old. I mean, that explains partially why he's exceptional in four languages, but also why he's just extremely comfortable riding the sand. You sort of marry his technique and his um, precision on the bike with that ability to adapt to a very changing service. And uh, I think um, Prado is, is is one of the best sand riders in the world. Uh, and Hurling's just, just general rustiness. I mean, he's shown his capabilities. And I think actually the weekend before, I'm not sure whether the round was of the Dutch Masters Championship, but he was he again was lapping people up to sort of third, fourth, fifth position. So, uh, I mean, Hurlings is definitely no slouch. And if he, for me, he still is the sand king. But um, Rado is also, uh, as you said, one of the world's best. Uh, we talked about um, the crashes that Prado and Hurlings had on Saturday. So this seems like a perfect time for me to tell you about Polisport. Do you remember all of the crashes and falls that you had and the levers that you destroyed because of that? Well, that's no longer a problem. Polisport released the Pivot Unbreakable Levers, a lever set that never breaks. If you fall, they can be bent back to their original shape. Easy as that. Incredible. Right? And do you want to know what is incredible? I forgot to mention at the top, this podcast is available in audio form. or video form and right now there is a polysport video advert running on screen if i've pushed the buttons correctly so what a, what an advancement of technology here so thank you to polysport for their support of this podcast and thank you to them for being the very first um video advert on this podcast which is groundbreaking moment for us all um could shed and a if tear. it didn't work uh, i think it worked i guess okay. we'll find out um, I, it seemed like it worked, but um, I may need another screen because re doing the read and playing the video ad at the same time, quite a lot for my little brain, especially at <laughs> half past midnight. Um, where were we? So Prado, is there anything else to say other than I don't know if this Kawasaki deal is done. I know I've we all think it's done. That's been said over and over. I've said on podcasts that I believe it's done more and more. It seems like it's incredibly likely, but not done done. I do right. not believe he's staying in GPs, though. So that's out. So, I mean, let's, let's look at it from a Kawasaki point of view. If they sign Prado for three years, Anderson's got one more season, right? Yes. So then who becomes... Assuming Anderson then moves on, then who becomes Kawasaki's main point person? Are we looking at someone like McAdoo or uh, Levi Kitchen? 
somebody like that? I mean, can you really put all your eggs in in a Spanish basket? They need to, because yeah, you you um are chucking options around there, and Prado is the best one. And Monster, we know how badly Monster want Prado, and again, they need him because um Red Bull are cleaning up worldwide at the moment. So yeah, I believe it will happen, but I don't believe it is it is as finalized as um maybe we all presumed. But I don't know. Well, what do I, I know? Uh, well, I mean, I'd heard that also. Um, sort of the Pira Mobility Group, KTM, had been informed that Prado would not be renewing his contract. That was one rumour that had surfaced. But who knows if it's true. But well, it's a big move. It's a big, big move. I mean, Prado, as we said on the previous show, has been riding Austrian machinery his entire life, not just his whole career. And, you know, to make that switch to Japanese aluminium frame, um, big change of energy drink. I mean, Prado was in... The Red Bull scheme, even before he could uh, illegally wear a Red Bull cap, or he was on one of the what's what's the uh, it's like Young Bulls or something like that. It's the you know the the preteen version of Red Bull. Um, I can't remember what it's called now, but he used to sort of when he was in European Championship racing, be wandering around the paddock wearing one of those kind of caps. So it's it's a it's a huge move in every respect, and uh, I do wonder when it'll be announced. Maybe at the end of Supercross. I, I do not believe that will happen. We are um, inadequate and uh, inferior and <laughs> terrible at that side. So we'll just hope that there's an announcement at some point. That's all we can do. Let's set the bar very low and not expect much. Um, so that's Prado. I do not believe there is much more to say about him. Other than, let's do this quickly. Hurlings doesn't crash. Does Hurlings win or does Prado win that moto? Uh, considering where they are at the moment in their current season, still Prado. But then if we fast forward to, say, Lomo, then I would like to think that Jeffrey is a little bit more up to speed, full of confidence and ready to attack, and it's a bit more of a race. Yeah, I would say Prado too, but not. I do not... I cannot imagine a situation where Prado won and Hurlings was dropped. So I say Prado won, or would have won, but with Hurlings, like, within two seconds is kind of my... Um, my judgment on how that would have gone uh we talked about tim uh anything else to say about tim i just feel like this is a very weird to say because he's got a perfect podium record thus far but this is a very anonymous tim geyser start to the season uh we've seen no, it before. no i i disagree completely i think he's perfectly in tune he's just staying with prado just building into the season again after, you know, a pretty, well, a difficult, I mean, he missed half a season last year breaking his femur. So I think, you know, a little bit like Hurlins, but more advanced, he's working his way into this, um, Lewis. So I think, you know, what he's done so far is extremely encouraging. But like I said earlier, I'm, I am slightly concerned about comments like, you know, he's not able to push like he wants because that does imply that there's still some work to do there in HRC. <clears throat> and as we're talking about Honda, do we mention Rowan van der Moestijk? Because that was a very underwhelming debut on the factory bike. I will say this. So as mentioned, the rumor was he's not the most um, motivated trainer in the paddock. The worst possible way to diffuse those rumors is to pull off in both <laughs> motos. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. Is like if, if the one goal was to shut those people up, that's not the way to do it. Um, and yes. to be honest... If I'm Rowan van der Moestijk and I'm struggling that bad, I think I just roll around. I do not believe that I start my hon uh, my team HRC period by pulling off. I think I just get to the checkered flag by any means necessary. So Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for example, if the front end is ridiculously soft and you need some changes, pull into the pit, try a couple more clicks, do something, and then go back out. Even use the Grand Prix like a test run, you know, because he obviously hasn't had that much time on the motorcycle. But um, just to sort of park the bike and say, well, that's, that's me for today. Unless there's some sort of issue we don't know about, then, yeah, it didn't look fantastic. Better days are, are ahead. And I say that with confidence because it really cannot get much worse. Um, quick point about Hurlings. Uh, we touched on his ribs. So the common consensus is there is no break. There is no fracture. His ribs were just banged up, which is a terrible medical term. But that is it, right? Yes uh intercostal muscles whatever else i don't know what that um, means but okay 
It's the muscles in between the ribs. I mean, oh. if there, any of those are sort of damaged or ripped or bruised or whatever, then, you know, that can affect his breathing. But the fact that he needed to take painkillers um, said quite a bit. But, yeah, I mean, Jeffrey is his, he's not the most um, robust of athletes So as he's proven over the years. So the fact that he had that crash, took a handlebar to, to the abdomen and was able to keep going and, you know, finished on the podium for the first time in uh, almost a year. I mean, June 2023 was the last time he took a trophy and that was in Latvia. Then that's um, still, I'd say the progress is still on track, Lewis. I mean, you and I both agreed that we thought he would be going for the podium, you know, by round two and which he'd be he fighting for victory. Yeah, and he'd be fighting for victory at this Grand Prix, which mm. he almost did <laughs> for, for a phase in the second moto. Uh, but yeah, it's the, the fact that he's on the podium now means what, according to our, you know, uh, non insignificant schedule, he's only one sort of race behind, but then I do wonder how things could go in Arco because he needs better starts than what he's doing. I have to remain, I have to remain judge. What's I'm, I'm very tired. Remain judgment. No retain judgment. No, uh, what I have to retain judgment. Yeah. What am I, I doing with my work. judgment? We'll I have to keep my judgment line. back. Preserve. Um, that's a word. I have to do that until round five because I completely overlooked the fact that after this weekend in Trentino, we have two weekends off, which is almost unheard of. So that will be the time to make significant gains. And by the time we get to round five, it will almost be like round one all over again. So if we come out at round five and this is still the norm, we've got issues. Yeah. So I, I almost look at these four races as... Um, a stint of preseason events, and then the series will start at round five. That's almost my mentality. Hence why I'm not overreacting to anything that is going on at the moment. Um, I think um, also for Jeffrey's record, he is not a good starter. I mean, he is not a whole shot man. And that's also something he has to address because Prado has those absolutely nailed and he has an advantage every single time that the gate drops. And I sort of tweeted um, on Sunday saying, you know, it's not going to be long before people have to sort of try and rattle Prado out of the gate. Otherwise, you know, he's just, his advantage is too great. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how you do that. I've actually given that a lot of thought. Um, what can you possibly do? Is there a different tactic? And every way I spin it, I don't know how you beat Prado out of the gate or even hurt his um, advantage there. Well, it's, this, it's the Ferrandis tactic, isn't it? I mean, you line up next to him, and the, the minute the gate drops, even if Prado does get that superior jump all the time, you move across, you put his elbows, you put your elbows in his way, or you try and rattle him a little bit. Something just to make him flinch on the gas, and then he doesn't have that whole shot, doesn't have that advantage. Two points about Hurlings. One, I find very interesting. Um, he finished third overall. He has done 177 GPs in his life. This is just the seventh time he has, been, he has finished third overall, which speaks oh, wow. to the fact that he is either incredible or off the podium. Seven times he's been third. Yeah, uh, four in MXGP, three in MX2. Wow. Okay. Uh, that, that it, like, although that is a very meaningless stat, that does say a lot about his... Um, yeah, like I say, he's either really incredible or he's not, on, not even close to the podium, essentially. Um, do you, I mean, you've got the rest of the t statistics about how many times he's finished. Well, we know how many times he's finished first, but then also how many times second, because that will also put it more into, into sort of stark reality, I guess. He has finished second on a 450 at 11 GPs. Right. And second on a 250 at, please hold, 15 GPs. And he's won 103 in both classes. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. So third place is, uh, you know, a strange um, frontier for Jeffrey. It's because if you are a talent as brilliant as Jeffrey, third overall is just a mediocre day at the office. And Jeffrey Hurlings does not have many mediocre days at the office. As we've said many times, there's always fireworks. There's always a story. There's always an incredible event. So rare for him to have one of these days where he just stands on that lowest step. And my other point about Hurlings, I've completely forgotten. Um, and it was actually <laughs> was it, a better point. So, Was it his second or his third contract renewal with KTM where he said, actually, cancel all my bonuses and put, put it on a win or nothing? 
because that news around the paddock was pretty amazing at the time. But then I think, you know, he justified it by winning quite a lot of motos that season. I, we talked about that in that interview I did last year. And I, I remember him having a weird reaction to that. Like his answer to that, the question about that was almost like we all um, overplayed it a little bit. Like it wasn't as big a deal as we made out or it wasn't the way that everyone, like, I can't remember what he said exactly, but it was definitely a bit like, oh. Um, and I really wish I could remember what my second point about hurlings was, but I cannot. So instead, I will make this point. Um, you mentioned earlier about the variety of tracks we've had to start the season. And honestly, we cannot get much better with that. Um, round one, unique, shallow sand, um, volcanic ash. Round two, man-made hard pack. Round three, old school, natural, bottomless sand. Round four, old school, natural, European hard pack. Like, this is the most um, brilliant example of what MXGP offers across four weekends. Yeah, and then going to France, I think, round five, which is St. John's Angeli, um, some very time-honoured hard pack as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a good spread, isn't it? I mean, it's um, it's the ultimate challenge. But just before we move on a little bit, and perhaps we should talk about Roman Febra too, uh, what about Rio Lozado, Lewis? Because in one way, it looks like this fantastically sort of hidden racetrack near the beach very sandy and very naturally set but in other ways it doesn't really look like a grand prix venue and i think we've said this before on podcasts you know when we talked about this grand prix this was actually the fourth time that the you know the world championship had gone to the isle of sardinia and um you know there was a press release before the grand prix where in front motor racing and various dignitaries from the local government were saying how good that the grand prix is for driving attention and tourism to a place that is in low season so therefore there's not sort of so many people around so you can see the benefits for of mxgp coming to town not just in terms of crowds because it didn't seem to be that many people there and the italian uh, italy in general has sort of always had quite a few races haven't they uh, every sort of mxgp calendar whether that will change in the coming years is something we have to see with the uh, diminishing tony Cairoli effect but I do, you know, I I question whether something like Rio Lozado re is really sort of Grand Prix spec. But then I guess the all weather purpose of the facility and, you know, it wasn't as deep and as rough as we've seen it in the past where it's been perhaps wetter. And certainly for some of the international, try and say this correctly, Internazionale di Italia pre-season international races that, you know, teams tend to use as a warm up um, ahead of the world championship, then it's been pretty gnarly there. I'm not the biggest fan of it. I do believe it's a bit of a... Well, it, it, at the end of the day, it's a practice track. Um, the paddock is shoehorned in. Uh, the, you never see too many spectators there, but I do not believe that's a coincidence. It's terrible for viewing. Um, it's essentially a track built in the dunes, so you cannot really see um, much from where you're stood apart from the section right in front of you. Uh, I did hear once from a fairly credible source that behind Indonesia... The Sardinian government pays uh, the second highest total to in front, and someone told me it was seven hundred and fifty grand. So, okay, which is believable because I mean the Sardinia tourism board banners are everywhere. Um, a big deal is made out of this. There's always an opening press conference, you know, like it's a big deal is made out of the fact that we are in Sardinia always. So, I could believe that. I don't know if a figure is correct, but I would wholeheartedly believe that. Um, Sardinia is the uh, most lucrative European GP for in front and for that reason I doubt it will go anywhere but um, yeah I, I would not rush back to Rio Lozado at any point well again as well it's just the climate tends to be so good and that's why teams test there in January and December because you know the temperatures are quite stable uh, and it's quite reliable even if it pisses with rain you can still race at that place so it's, it's a useful Grand Prix let's file it like that uh, let's talk about Roman Fevre just to get the title contenders done and dusted. Uh, bike problem on Saturday, outside gate pick for Sunday, salvaged what he could. But, and I'm going to put it to you bluntly here, is there now no hope of Roman Fevre winning this championship without the other riders getting hurt or having some sort of serious issue? I don't have the points difference in front of me, but I, it's just way too early, isn't it? If we were mid-season, then I'd say it's not looking too great. I mean, I think he needs to have 
perhaps won a moto or given Prado a, a slightly harder run. I do wonder when, you know, this uh, impending triumph deal will be announced, uh, you know, how that kind of affects the working relationship at the Kawasaki team. Uh, will it be his, this is his third year in those, in that, not in Kawasaki colors, but with that particular squad. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I just wonder how that's going to affect things behind the scenes as well, Lois. But, um, you know, Febra's too good and too fast to be counted out of this yet. Speaking of uh, gaps, so Hurlings is 49 points down, Fevre is 51 down. So basically the same. But my point being, I am much more likely to bet on Jeffrey Hurlings going 1-1 a couple of times and clawing back points than I am Roman Fevre in this field. Yeah, yes, I agree with that. But then I'll be more likely to say that Roman's going to go the distance because that's one sort of criticism you could point at Jeffrey in recent years. When Jeffrey has gone towards the end, he's either won the championship or been right in it until the last laps. Uh, but, you know, Febber has also been somebody that hasn't really had massive injury scares. Okay, he broke his femur with the Yamaha, what was that, 2019? Yeah, just before the pandemic. Uh, he had a knee issue, and of course, you know, he wrecked his um, his foot, uh, or sorry, his, his right leg, I think, at the Paris Supercross. But, uh, you know, I think Febra is going to be sort of just motoring through this for the long haul. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not as sold on that as you are. I believe that we have seen a lot of inconsistency from Febra throughout his career. Um, not as much as Jeffrey, of course. But I don't believe that Roman is that safe, reliable pair of hands. Whereas I would I would lean to Prado and Tim uh, in that category and have Jeffrey and Roman in this very... Um, unpredictable category. But what do I know? How have you, how have you found interviewing Roman Febra? Uh, in general? In general. Um, it's okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit... You, you don't, I feel like it's hard to get a rapport with him. Um, so you don't really make the same progress you do with other riders where like the barriers are lowered a little bit. I feel like with Roman it's always quite to the point and like we're going to do the interview and we're going to move on um why'd you ask i just wondered you know compared to your recent experiences with eli tomac you know is there anyone in mhgp that's also being a little bit uh indifferent well you know someone did mes message me after that incident and say um the, the rider in mhgp who runs the same number as tomac is of a very similar personality so maybe it's something to do with the number <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be. Which, which isn't which isn't wrong, is it? It's not wrong at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I have to say that my experiences with Roman interviewing him, uh, you know, usually he's great, but he's also one of these athletes that will look at you and almost suppress an eye roll and say, "How yes. long is it going to take?" Mm. And you kind of think, "Well, you know, how long are you going to talk for? How long is a piece of string?" Uh, you know, it's. I don't know if that's a comment on maybe our interviewing technique. You know, are you going to talk to me for half an hour when I've only got 10, 15 minutes for you? But, you know, there are not many sort of riders in MXGP that kind of have that approach whereby it's an inconvenience for them or a dislike. But then again, I, maybe we've been too harsh on Roman. I mean, we were asking him to express himself um, sometimes on quite detailed topics in his second language. It's, it's not that easy. Yeah, to your point, at no point have I interviewed Roman and been like, this is great. Like, we're, he's loving it. I'm loving it. Let's just keep this going. Like, I've always been like, uh, I need to get out of here quite quickly because he does not want to do this. Um, yeah. Which, yeah, is not a pattern in MXGP. Every rider, I feel like, is very happy to talk and share and, like, go back and forth and have a discussion. Um, it's one of the greatest points of MXGP. And as I've, mess as I've said many times, in front need to capitalize on that more. But I also wonder how many times are riders doing interviews now where it's not in front of a camera? Oh, that's, you know, that's, there's... that's gone. Even, yeah, even I mean... me who has always said I would never, ever do interviews behind a camera, I've had to cave. I've had to. I've, I've had to. It's just... I mean, those things where you can sit down in a motorhome and do a bit of a deep dive over 30 minutes on their background or their approach or a change in their career or a new direction or something like that. I, I would, as an athlete, I, you know, if I'm trying something new and it's especially if it's working, I think I'd want to talk about it. And I'm not talking about a a two and a half minute video clip for social media, but actually something where somebody's interested and wants to reveal or, or explain the reasons or wherefores or whatever. Uh, yeah, it just seems to be something that's maybe fading out 
but I, I think we're say, raking over old ground here. This funny, this is a funny point about America that I found since moving here. Um, you say to any rider, uh, "Can we do a quick interview?" They immediately look for their hat because they're just like, "Oh, this has to be on video." <laughs> and when you're like, uh, 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 "It's just audio," they're like, "What?" It's like, "Yeah, it's just audio." They're like, "Oh," like they almost don't know what to do. Like, how do you do that? Like, what do I do? How do I perform on audio? Like, it's it's like a whole new world. Um, yeah, funny. MXGP's not gone that far yet, but probably one day. I mean, all it's full of is uh, videographers nowadays. I recently said, what do I know? Which is a brilliant segue into the rider who finished fourth overall. And you know, as with a lot of us great explorers, um, visionaries, if you like, we are laughed at, we are mocked, um, we're before our time. And... Okay, I was a year early. I'll admit it, I was a year early, but that's the visionary in me coming out. And now I'm here, and I'm happy, and I'm ready to reap the rewards and hear the nice comments that you have to say to me regarding Paul Jonas's brilliant start to the season. The floor is yours. Uh, Feel free to do the Tomac stare to that question. <laughs> vindicated, Lewis. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a, it's been a good start mm. to the season. Yeah, that's Just, it. Some that, of us see it and you. some of us don't. I mean, it's a, a gift. good a good start to the season. You know, I those of us who are visionaries should not look down on those who do not possess the same gift and knack as we have. So I'm not going to do but, that in this case because you do you, Adam. Yes. You do you. I, you're, you're sort of talking as if I'm a doubter or I, you know, didn't have any belief. But no, I I'm thought, talking you know, as if I'm a I've genius. Always... <laughs> <laughs> I've always rated Paul's, but he just has, and he'll be the first to admit it, a chronic problem with staying fit and staying competitive. I mean, it's not too much to ask. You're a fast rider. You're a hard worker. Just stay healthy. Well, do you want to know what I, in talking to him, I think I know why this is going to go better this year. He has understood that now. He has found the limit, and he has he has understood the mechanics of his brain that has made him go over the limit in the past. So he's very self aware of like, this is where I need to not push. Like we right. joked. I think it's okay for me to say this. We joked after Spain. He wasn't very comfortable. Like he wasn't very happy with what he did, but he took what he could. Um, and we joked after the race for old pools would have crashed out because old Pauls right. would have tried to force the issue and be like, no, better can be achieved. I have to get there. Um, so that's why I believe that he will continue this fine form. And to be honest, if I'm a factory team or any team, I'm looking at Pauls and going, that could be it for the future because if this is going to continue to trend upwards, I could get 2018 Pauls Jonas who's actually more mature now, so maybe an improved version, and maybe no other people in the paddock aren't going to spot that. In a time where it is a rider's market and you have to be a bit savvier, I believe, with your moves, um, I believe that's a good good pick um, on the draft, yeah. if you will. While you were talking, I was just looking up his age, and he's, he's only 27. I mean, he's not, you know, by any means long in the tooth. So now is a good time to actually be maturing and coming into something of a 450 prime. The whole, like, I've long been on the Watson wagon. I've long been Jeremy's mate. I just, I feel like I may, I may have the Paul's flag more than anyone at this point. I may just, like, right. I may just rebrand myself to Paul's Jonas supporter because I feel like I'm I there. Mean, yeah, that faith has, you know, been a bit blind in the past, hasn't yeah. it? I, I see now it. You're, you... I see it. That's all I, all I can say. I see it. Like okay. people who see a ghost, and you you may not see it, but I do, and I'm gonna continue to believe that what I saw is correct. Um, we're dancing no. with the supernatural. Yeah, as we're For talking about Pauls, can I can I sort of mention a, a peeve of mine about MXGP? Okay. On the podium, riders wearing goggles while they spray champagne. I think it looks unbelievably lame. It's I mean, so Euro, I, I, isn't it? It's so I, yeah, Euro. I think if. I apologize if I'm wrong, but Stefan Everts may have been one of the first to do it. Uh, you know, he would wear the goggles, which, okay, fantastic exposure for Oakley. Uh, you know, when normally they'd be sort of draped around a rider's neck, but it just looks so naff. 
And I remember saying it to Paul Jonas once, I think it's 2018. I said, look, you know, why do you always wear like goggles on the podium spraying champagne? It just looks really lame, especially when you have like a Pirelli cap or something on the top. And he was like, well, how do I do it then? I said, look at some pictures of Ayrton Senna. You know, Ayrton Senna would get on the podium and you would take a very expensive bottle of champagne or Prosecco or whatever. And he would just hold it upside down and dump it all over his head. And it's sort of, you know, just made for these really dramatic photographs. So he says, all right, I'm going to try doing it. And if, you, if anyone goes to look on the KTM media library in 2018 or 19, you'll see some shots of Paul Jonas on the podium celebrating a win where he's just like dousing himself in this sort of whole bottle of champagne. And it's cool. It's cool yeah, celebration. I've seen that. So this was you. This, this was what I put it up to. I put him up to it and it worked. It looked good. And he was pretty happy with it. But, you know, stop wearing goggles on the podium. I mean, if champagne really irritates your eyes that much, then, you know, I think you need to sort of reappraise your uh, general view of success in life. For some reason, I've always struggled with goggle straps. I don't know why, but my mind cannot comprehend, like, how to make it tighter or looser. So if I was on the podium, I would very much struggle with getting the goggles to stay on my head because um, maybe it's because I was always in a bit of a panic when I was sat on the start <laughs> of a local race and trying to like figure out my goggles, but yeah, never could figure it out. Um, Paul well, there's Jonas... two things there, Lewis. You're, you, you probably won't ever get on top of a podium, so you don't have to worry no, about that's it. True. And then the second thing is just the, um, the, the goggle strap is not that difficult to operate. Yeah, but you know, sometimes you get in a bit of a faff and you get a bit emotional and then uh, that's where you end up. Um, moving down the order a little bit, uh, I wanted to give a nod to Calvin Vlanderin, one of only five riders to score points in every single moto slash qualifying race um, this year. And although it's not been spectacular, maybe, I do believe he is having a mighty fine start to the season. And I think that now that he's got the factory tag, people will judge him more harshly, maybe, and overlook when he's having a good season. So I'm here to say that this is a really nice start. Yeah, but on the other side of the coin, he's a former winner in Rio de Sardo, so perhaps he should have been a bit closer to podium contention. Yeah, he said he was frustrated, and he said that he just struggled to find a, a flow. or yeah, just like It never really got started for him. So, yeah, he was frustrated. But still, like, look at the points he's, um, he's stacked up. I mean, hold on, I'm going to pull it up quickly. He's, well, the um, situation for factory Yamaha is absolutely critical at the moment. Um, you know, their two principal riders are injured, and that's even sort of sort of Calvin holding the plate a little bit. But, uh, I mean, is he going to be able to rise up and deliver some of the, the results that a, a team of that ilk and status demand? That That's going to be the big question for him. And, and maybe slightly unfair, because like you say, with a factory tag, he should be, and as a third rider on the team, he's one that's maybe should be banking those solid top five results. And the, the results that he's posting now is what you'd normally expect. Yeah, like that's my point. He is seventh in the championship, just nine points behind Sewer. And if Renault and Gertz were healthy, that would be brilliant. And everyone would be cheering because he's a third rider on that team, essentially, and he's doing that well. But because he's now been promoted... Um, to the number one rider, people are going to be a bit more critical. But I'm just trying to, you know, keep everyone's feet on the ground, so to speak. Um, just looking out for everyone, you know. I'm just really, uh, <laughs> really trying to help everyone, which transitions nicely into Jeremy Sewer, who was very happy that he got good starts. And that's all I've got. <laughs> well, he had a bit of an off as well, didn't he? Uh, and he's, he's crashed hard before in Sardinia. So Jeremy must like the sort of the Italian sand in that area of the world, but it hasn't been the kindest racetrack to him. And he's another rider that works extremely hard to be good and fast in the sand. He's certainly no slouch. I mean, he's not on Prado's level, uh, not on Hurlings' level. You could argue that he's, you know, kind of as fast as perhaps Tim or Roman. I mean, he, on, a, on a good day when he's feeling flush with a the bike, then he can push them. But uh, yeah, I do wonder how much more he's got to give at the moment on the current setup in, in that team and with that motorcycle. It's still new to him. I think we've got to give him time to acclimatize. But let me ask you this question, Lewis. If you had like a 50 euro note and you had to bet on whether Jeremy Sue is going to be in green again next year, would you put it in yes or no? Ha. Um, no. Okay. Well, where does he go then? Um, Lewis Phillips Racing. Ah, uh, so, okay. 
But I, don't, I wrote an article about this yesterday. Um, it's going to be crazy because there are so many rides and not enough good riders. So we will inevitably end up in a position where there is a factory team next year that is just racing in ninth and 10th every week. And that's the factory team's lot. They're not really going to get higher than that. Which is crazy because factory seats have always been reserved for the very, very best. And therefore, the very, very best results have been secured. And that's just not going to be the culture from now on. It's just not. Like, if I'm a team manager right now, I'm panicking because the, as I said, the culture, the approach, it's all changing. You've got, you can't play the game as you have in the past. And some people are going to mess that up a little bit. I, I don't think there's that many places. I mean, he could go to being Tim Geiger's teammate in Honda. But then, you know, he's well, not going to go back to Yamaha. So why not just stay another year at Kawasaki? Or what? he could follow Roman Febber and be a second rider at Triumph. But I can't see them having that kind of budget in their first year. I'm unclear on this. So as we've said, HRC never share the how long a rider's contract is for. So do we believe that Ruben is up at the end of this year? Yeah, that's... Yeah, we're ignorant of that fact. I don't know. Because it was he obviously signed a year ago. Well, a little over a year ago. They said multi-year contract. I would lean towards two years, which would be up this year. There's no way you're, ha you're handing Ruben Fernandez a three-year contract unless HRC have lost their mind, in which case I need to get the advisor on the phone. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it could be a two plus one. And yeah. then they just say to him, look, you wrecked your knee. We know you're out relax we want you for another year or they're talking to the likes of jeremy sura or somebody else but i don't see i mean the the sort of the the mo for hrc is to have that sort of leading championship rider plus you know a good strong second rider not to have like two a-listers if you like and uh, i i don't really see jeremy being in that team but you never know if the japanese change their strategy well, this is a, once again, just segue after segue after segue on this podcast. <laughs> this leads me lovely into a point I had. Kevin Horgmo has been a revelation so far. I personally never in a million years believed he could be this good on a 450. And I would hazard a guess that most of the paddock joined me in that line of thinking. He has been great, especially considering this is early days. He should only get better. Uh, 12, 10, 11, 9, 10, 10 across the six motos so far. So, is Horgmo a realistic option for a factory team, or is he just not in that cool club? Uh, I don't think he's in the cool club yet. And I know that's a bit of a weak answer, but at least there are at least four factory riders that are out injured at the moment. So put those in, and then if he's sliding yeah, down yeah. to sort of 10, 11, 12 positions, then it suddenly looks like a, yeah, you know, a pretty decent first season on a 450. That's a, that's a great point. I, I sometimes lack common sense. I'll just come out and admit it, because, yeah, that is just... No, but no, your enthusiasm is, you know, and I think... I don't even really know Kevin, gonna... but here I am. Just, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll add his flag to my uh, to my collection. No, but it's a good point because you, you're looking towards the the next guy. Who's the next guy? I mean, I think we had sort of perhaps Gertz down as the the one who was going to break through next, but then that injury means he's he's sort of like fallen to the wayside somewhat. But um, yeah, yeah, solid season so far for Hulk, mate. Yeah, I'm very impressed, and I just want him to get the credit he deserves as well. Um, oh, and don't forget Ferrato. I mean, he's not a factory rider, but then there's another, you know, top ten guy at least who's out. I would bet. So, Hor I would bet that if Ferrato was racing, Horgmo would be ahead of him. Mm, sorry to pop your balloon, Kevin, but uh, keep doing what you're doing, and you know, keep aiming for those sort of top high, top tens. Then this, maybe you're doing all right. This podcast is great because the Americans tend to say that I'm a little bit negative but what they now see on this podcast is it's just like the british approach like yeah it's just a bit more of a 360 perspective that's all if you're going to say something is amazing then there has to be a reason for that so i stumbled onto the american version of family fortunes uh whilst i was okay. waiting for you oh my god it's um it's unbelievable there's so much excitement in the room 
that it's like I could not fathom it because the British version is is obviously people just stood there like, all right, yeah, like oh cool thanks. The American version is just like. Oh my god, great answer, great answer. It's just like, oh, like, honestly, I was watching it, like, I need to communicate this with someone, and this podcast is now my first opportunity to do that. But anyway, um, besides the point. Uh, moving down quickly, uh, what else is there to say? Ben Watson was really, really good, but oh my god, he needs a start. Because if he gets a start, he can run with the cold and off landering group. I watched the times, I watched the sector times, I've done deep dive research... He can run with that group with a start, no doubt. I mean, we know how good he is in the sand. Um, we're talking about people like Horgmo. Ben is a two-time GP winner. People like Horgmo, Mostike, they never got to that level in MX2. But oh my God, he needs a start because otherwise it's not going to happen. What was he doing in the second moto? I even thought he was just going to go straight on at the first corner and rejoin the track somewhere else. Honestly, you know? the starts but are there so might bad. Be a chance he may yeah, as well do Nobody that. saw it. He, he may as well just do that. The starts are that bad. Like, <laughs> it's... I don't know what I don't know. I mean, I don't think the beta is the best bike out of the gate, but I don't know how we fix that. Um, can I um, also on sort of the British scene? Can I give full props to Todd Kellett, who came in as a last minute sort of substitute fill in rider for the factory Yamaha team and um, the beach specialist, as we mentioned on the last podcast, uh, minimal Grand Prix experience, especially in them. It, it might have even been his first MXGP Grand Prix. I don't know if he's no, had he a filled wild card in, he in... filled in for a host. Detler Yamaha a couple of years ago at Lommel. Okay, good shout. Then, um, you know, I can't remember where he finished overall. He picked up points, of course, but he gave one of the best quotes I thought of the weekend where he said, um, I felt like a squash player trying to play tennis. So, um, you know, there you go. Yeah, that is, a, that is actually quote quite machine. good. Quite articulate. Great answer. Great answer. Um, um, yeah. Brilliant. So, we're done with MXGP. Brilliant. Thank you to MXGP riders. You all did very well. We're very proud of you. Uh, good luck to everyone in Trentino. On to MX2. But before we do that, the All Balls Racing Group is a combination of the finest aftermarket power sports brands from across the US and Europe, combining OEM level engineering and design capabilities with a world class supply chain makes them the largest global supplier of critical aftermarket hard parts for the power sports industry. You can trust the All Balls Racing Group to provide the exact fitment and best quality in the industry at a price that fits your budget. The All Balls Racing Group has everything that you need to keep running. Like Forrest Gump. Um, on to MX2. Is it, is it All Balls? Yeah, why? What, what, do you, what am I saying? No, no. I mean, I'm just with our British accents. All it's, it's like, Balls. Like B-A-L-L-S. Yes. Oh, okay, right. All, all balls. balls. All that... balls. Great answer, great answer. Um, right, MX2. <laughs> and for the first time since Paul's Jonas in 2018, we have an MX2 rider who has swept the first three rounds. Uh, Kaida Wolf continues to be a revelation. Honestly, the Sardinia win was the most expected of the trio of triumphs. Um, even though it actually was maybe the most questionable based on his teammate's speed. But we'll kick this discussion off with this question. Neither of us picked Kai DeWolf as our favourite heading into the season. Are you now in a position where you would put your money on Kai DeWolf winning this title? Oh, money is a, money is a push. Uh, I'm liking him more than anybody else. I... I like a little. I did Lucas Kuna. No, that's even more of a big gamble. Yes, too early. <clears throat> Simon Lagenfelder. Yes, I think he's somebody that's just going to be there for the long run. You know, I think he's he's going to be getting sort of those podium top four, top fives all the way through. Uh, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to sort of pin sort of pick anybody else. Um, Thibaut Benestan, I think, has been a little underwhelming so far this season. A so little? I mean, the, yeah, I mean, I'd say again, massively. Yeah, but again, coming back from that injury thing, you've got to give him some time to build into it because we're now looking at for the second year in a row. Is it second year? Three point scoring motos per weekend. But um, yeah, the Wolf, uh, he's doing everything we thought he would be doing two years ago, right? Yes, actually, that is a very good point. This is late. 
like this should have happened by now um i would love to know what has caused it to happen now uh, in talking to people i believe that although he had ruben last year he maybe didn't understand the Ruben effect yet like he had to understand like I guess it as with any relationship it takes time for them to learn each other figure out the best way to get the most out of each other um and I believe they've reached that point now almost hilarious that in all past seasons we've commented that his size hurts him on the start um but now that he's winning suddenly his starts are amazing maybe yes I, I do wonder what engine he's got I mean, I know uh, in the past it was Jed Beaton and Tom Vial having the factory engines from Austria. Uh, maybe it's Kai and also Adamo uh, on the current well, spec. But expand on that because I do not believe that that has ever been made public. And I heard, I found out about that when it happened, but I was not confident enough to communicate it because I didn't really understand. Because uh, at the end of the day, Lagenfelder, Kunin, DeWolf, Adamo, Everts, other Kunin are all Austrian factory riders. But the floor is yours. Uh well, okay. Um <laughs> that's that's what I mean. I'm slightly ignorant to the 2024 situation. I don't know who is running the same engine spec. Like, for example, last year I wouldn't say that Liam Everts was running the same spec engine as Andrea Adamo, uh, particularly at the start of the year, once he got that first victory. Again, and untimely that we're coming up to the Grand Prix of Trentino for round four because that was where Adamo won his first Grand Prix and Everts also got on the podium. Uh, you know, that could have, that might have started to change. But I would be very surprised if Austria had the resources to be able to give equal factory engines to all of those riders. Uh, and I would, you know, as we saw in the past in Husqvarna, Kaida Wolf did not have the same engine spec as Jed Beaton. So it's uh, maybe that's a similar situation. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll make some message. I'll send some messages and try and find out for the for the podcast next week. You know what? We obviously want Hurlings as our next guest because it's headline name. I really feel like we need Rasmus on because I have a, we. I believe that we actually have a lot of questions for Rasmus. <laughs> um, well, not even just not even just for MX2, where his team are, are kicking everything, but also for the status of Mattia Guadagnini, you know, who should have been his MXGP rider, and also Austria's second, well, third main presence in the Premier class, because after Hurlings and Prado, you know, other than that, then you know the the brands between KTM Gasgas and Husky are looking a little light. Yeah, and actually, I would ask Rasmus about that situation that I said with um, it being a rider's market in MXGP. Does that almost um, add some reluctance to Nastan Husqvarna's approach to MXGP? Because now it's going to be even harder for them to get an elite talent. So is it? All, do they go back to just being an MX2 team, or do they enter the fire pit of... Um, Hot bids yeah. and large bids because it, it's a rider's market. If you want, if you want a top top rider now, you're going to have to pay for it, uh, and more significantly. I genuinely believe that because at the end of the day, the riders can go anywhere they want. Um, so we're going to find out engine specs for the next podcast, and we're going to try and get Rasmus on as well. Maybe save Jeffrey for the one after. But uh, if we come back to Kaida Wolf, then I think Lewis is just about maturity. And somebody somewhere has had a word in his ear saying, this is how you win a championship because you've got three point scoring races per weekend. You cannot afford to be injured and miss a big chunk of that. And uh, at the moment, I think the biggest thing that people cannot see or really measure is just how much confidence the Wolf has, both in his ability to get out of the gate and to, to close Grand Prix motos. The, the biggest factor he might have to worry about is ironically his teammate and the guy just like six foot away from him in the awning every weekend. And um, maybe we should talk about the Coonan brothers because uh, they just, they're sort of just like this mercurial presence in Grand Prix racing at the moment, aren't they? Where you just, you never really know what's going to happen. I mean, Sasha first, two hole shots, both of the hole shots in both motos, but then just barreling around the track and making mistakes. 17 years old, both of them. I do wonder... Uh, it's that cliche, isn't it? You you got the speed, you just have to eradicate the mistakes. So at one point, Sasha Kunin is going to turn into like a Tom Vial, you would imagine. Uh, but then, you know, he's he's close to hurting himself. I think he knocked his head uh, in the first moto in, in Rio de Sado. So it's, uh, you know, you just kind of cross your fingers that nothing's going to happen to him. And when you come to Lucas, you could say that he's maybe the more able-bodied, certainly physically at the moment, maybe a bit more development in terms of racecraft for sure. 
but then uh, those sort of dis- those critical mistakes are really sort of hampering him. Okay, so say that Kaido Wolf is our not uh, uh, whether you want to use the term favorite or not, whatever. Um, Kaido Wolf is leading the championship. Who would you peg as his greatest threat competition? Who does still he have to worry about? Lagenfelder and Adamo. Oh, Purely still because Adamo. Of the experience. Yeah, he's like seven hundred points down. <laughs> Okay, slight exaggeration. But Adamo, just for the people that, um, you know, there was some confusion on the TV broadcast over why Adamo was penalized in the second moto when he should have gone 4 3 for third overall. Uh, He got out of shape, went off the track, and had to go through the pit lane. Uh, And there's a rule in the pit lane that if you're going through it, you have to stop. Um, And he didn't because he wasn't, that was the only way for him to rejoin the track. And therefore he was DQ'd. Afterwards, he said he felt that the disqualification was perhaps a bit harsh and I have to agree with him there. I mean, why not a penalty? Uh, you know, I don't even know if there's a speed limit or how you can enforce that in the pit lane. It's not MotoGP, but, uh, it does seem a little bit harsh to be DQ'd for just going through a pit lane, especially if he couldn't rejoin the track. Yeah. Because technically it wasn't, it was an off track advantage. And if you had an off track advantage anywhere else, you wouldn't be disqualified. You would just be penalized points or seconds or whatever. So it is peculiar. But they are very sensitive about pit lane because I don't remember a penalty like this, but 2015 Latvia, Tommy Searle was disqualified for entering the pit lane at the wrong end. Um, which at the time that kind of baffled me because I was like, well, he had to go into the pit lane. So like, it's not like he's gaining from that. But, so they're very sensitive about pit lane uh, rules for whatever reason. Yeah, uh, fair enough, because there's a lot of people there and there's a lot going on. It's not the biggest of spaces either. And, you know, maybe Adama ripped through there like in fourth gear or something. We don't know. We didn't see that. But, yeah, I think it's, like you say, he was in a position where he didn't make any gain and that was the only way he thought he could rejoin the track. So I think you have to take it in a, a bit of a case-by-case example. I don't know anyway, but Adamo would have been, you know, on the podium with some good points there. And afterwards, he actually sounded quite chipper about his performance and his speed at the weekend. So the sort of the early season worries we had about the world champion, I think will erode a little bit. And again, he's another rider who's just going to be there. So I, I would think that the Wolf really has to have a hard look at, you know, the Gas Gas and the KTM and, um, you know, obviously try and keep one eye on his teammate. 70 points is a lot for Adamo. That is a massive gap, especially when, um, similar to the hurlings Fevre discussion, I do not believe that Adamo possesses the speed advantage to just start clocking off wins. But on the other hand, would you put money on DeWolf being this perfect all the way through? I mean, something's going to go wrong at some time. Honestly, at this point, I wouldn't put money on any of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's like, why MX2 is actually pretty engaging this year. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I'm not even going to put money on Simon now, um, which breaks my heart because I've well, been there. I love the, the sense of mystery about Kaida Wolf because for the last few years, it's always been Yago Gertz and Tom Vial. I mean, since 2020, effectively, and also Maxime Renault. I mean, you've had a, a clear uh, tier of riders who are superior. And now we have these riders who are a little bit more on the same sort of level. And they could trip each other up each weekend. And I think that's why it's going to be more interesting to watch MX- MX2 than it has been in the past. Uh, speaking of Simon Lagenfelder, for the first time since Czech Republic last year, his second moto was better than his first. So <laughs> we'll take Good that. Stat. That is a that is a positive. Uh, bucking the trend somewhat. Um, Camden McClellan had his first podium of his career. Uh, really happy for him. South African. Between he looked fucked though, didn't he? Yes, he looked absolutely. It, it, fucked. I'm not even sure he realised where he was. <laughs> but um, between him and Vlanderin, South Africa have a nice presence in MXGP again. And you know what? I I feel like this was coming with McClellan. I don't even believe this is that much of a shock. What is a shock though is thus far in MX2. There has not been a single Japanese bike on the podium. Oh wow. And imagine if, if you went back to 2014 and told someone that's how a season would start, the only possible explanation 
would be KTM swept the podium at all of the rounds because at that point Husqvarna weren't relevant, let alone Gas Gas and Triumph. So um, yeah, funny how times change, isn't it? Like this is now quite normal to the like to the point where I hadn't even noticed that. Whereas ten years ago, that would have been the most shocking news ever. Well, I mean, apart from, I mean, a Honda and Kawasaki have been pretty much in decline, haven't they, for a few years of MX2. And, you know, Fernandez kept Honda burning brightly, despite the fact that the bike was woefully underpowered and he was too big for it. Uh, again, that's one reason why I think you have to give him props for what he achieved in MX2. But, uh, you know, Yamaha have been the only real Japanese brand that have put a lot of investment in sort of technical development to be able to match the Austrian bikes, Lewis. But, I mean, that's a really good call. I, I to, And I didn't notice it either. So that does show how much um of a grip that the austrian bikes have had on the 250s at the moment but um you know fair play to triumph i mean that's a, a second podium finish in what three rounds it's um it's a, I, I say that's quite a dreamy start for them actually yeah well uh triumph have had more podiums than red bull ktm like that's, there you go when you when you lay it out in layman's terms it is very impressive even more so um speaking of engines and speaking of yamaha i hear no star engines in MXGP anymore, more ja or MX2, sorry, more Japanese involvement. It's more like that's now finalized and it's not going to change, is my understanding. Like we're now going down that path and that's where we're staying. Um, of course, the star involvement was kind of a Gertz specific situation and kind of leaked over to other riders because of politics and whatnot. Um, but now that Gertz is out of the class, I feel like that's just gone bye bye. Um, yeah, so. also, I mean, he was a clear title contender where you could say now Yamaha are not weaker is maybe a harsh word, but, you know, I don't think that they don't have the same sort of standing with the, as they had with Gertz. I mean, props to people like, you know, we haven't really seen so far or good speed so far this season, like Rick Elzinga. Um, you know, I think, uh, who else was it? The name's completely gone out of my mind. But, um, but yeah, you know, Ben Stan, we mentioned you know, maybe building into the season a little bit. I know you're underwhelmed, but I think you still have to give him a bit of time. But uh, fair. also, I have to say, um, the Troy Lee Designs gear just looks so cool. I mean, the Yamaha boys really stand out for for their, their gear, you know, just as a random tangent. Well, other gear is available. Uh, we do not have a gear sponsor, so if you want to hear that your gear is nice, get in touch, and we'll say that on this podcast. Um, yeah. Unless uh, your FXR. Yeah. Uh, Anything else from <laughs> MX2? <laughs> no, um, that's it. Um, I mean, that was, a really, us that was a really small snippet, but we've got to go. Um, I guess the only other... Uh, TV commentary. Jason uh, Thomas, Paul Maiden. I mentioned it earlier, and uh, I thought it was really good. Because you, it's not often you get two uh, people who are talking about the sport, who have done it, who have been there, and are able to articulate it in a way that's kind of interesting and also engaging so uh i thought they complemented each other really well as they usually do i mean jt pops over for what maybe two to three grand prix every season and i thought the tv package you know we've been critical of that or i've been critical of it lewis um there was some the drone shots actually showed off the kind of remoteness of rio Lozado, as you say and you know i just thought that the information relay um coming through from paul and jason throughout the motors actually made all of that viewing time pretty bearable actually it was uh you know there's, there's a lot of motocross to watch if you're following both classes and it was uh, it was good to listen to pretty bearable the review that mxgp have so desperately wanted <laughs> they have been chasing that review for years Look at, <laughs> i'm sure that will yeah, be um the behind the gate stuff is good. I mean, that's like a you know attempt towards quality and showing a behind the scenes perspective on MXGP. Honestly, you know? don't tell Dan Luongo, but I've never watched it. Okay, yeah, but Dan's going to be a bit annoyed about that. <laughs> I was I was worried you wouldn't remember the Dan situation. Um, yeah, Dan, because Dan that's did uh, Dan did pull me last year and say, "Have you been watching?" And I went, "Yeah, it's really good." <laughs> no, like and Federico and the guys are really. Uh, you know, who's producing it and trying to create something different. They're really enthusiastic and you cannot knock that. And I think, you know, MHGB will be far the poorer for it. So, I mean, as long as they keep trying to do that sort of stuff, I think that's sort of the bare minimum now you have to do to present the sport in a, in a way that's just going to sort of 
hold attention other than the sort of formulaic uh, live race coverage. I won't be happy um, until the two pre-race interviews have disappeared. That, right. I refuse to be happy until that changes. Yeah, but then you need some sort of, you know, you need some sort of ride or reference to say, actually, this track is really good or yeah, it's really bad or it's really hard or it's much harder than it was last year, that kind of stuff. At this point, even if they did one, I would be happier because like, oh my God, we have exited the box somewhat. That We have done two at every race. For twenty yeah. million years, um, yeah, back I when it was called scrambling, Lisa Lehman was on the start line asking two riders questions. Yeah, get Lisa down to the first corner and say, like, you know, we've seen people trying to take this line here, okay, maybe they need to go there, you know, or let's back it down. I, I think that's a bit <laughs> optimistic. I'm not sure that Lisa Leyland does a great job. I'm not sure that she possesses the know-how to talk lines and tactics and whatnot. Well, it just needs somebody to say, Lisa, this is what's happening. Or even go down there with a, a rider or a team manager or a rider coach or somebody like that. There must be somebody other, some other person in the MHGB paddock who can help with the TV broadcast by saying, this is what riders are doing. I mean, maybe a less controversial David Billman, you know, somebody who says that, you know, on the first corner, you know, we saw the track developing like this, but today it's much wetter or drier or dustier. Uh, riders need to be going there you know something that just brings a little bit more explanation or insight into what is actually going on on the day yeah there are enough uh trainers and whatnot stood along the start to grab one and just pull them onto the track for a second but, somebody who can talk on tv yeah which is anyone really um well yes and no i mean okay. you know there's some people that just melt when they're red red lights on well that used to be that was me when i first did it um, so you've got to give everyone a chance, otherwise they won't, uh, they won't and progress. I have another question for you, Lewis. Uh, would you be, uh, what's the word? Enthusiastic? We've been mentioning that one a lot. Would you be keen to go back to Thailand for another Grand Prix? Yes, I was going to ask you about this. So where did you get this from? Well, I saw on LinkedIn, there's, um, I'm going to try and pronounce his name correctly. Oh, wow. uh, Kritos Wongsawang. Uh, who was basically the the power behind the Thai Grand Prix when it's in So Racha, uh, also in the um, the infamous Grand Prix where Ryan Villapoto won his his only Grand Prix. Uh, I can't remember the name of the Nak, venue now. Nakrishkanka. Na uh, yeah. Nakrishkanka or something. Yeah, Siracha was south of Bangkok. This one, I think, was north. Well, he, apparently, he's given some sort of presentation for a future Thai Grand Prix, and it's based in Chiang Rai. Uh, in Singa Park, which is right in the north of, of Thailand, right on the Burmese border. I, I looked it up and it's just like a natural park and uh, it seems they're trying to get a Grand Prix there or I don't know if it's confirmed or how far along it is, but there was some sort of presentation. So, uh, you know, maybe MHGB could be going back to Thailand. Well, let's get Mr. Wong on this podcast. Um... Yeah, we'll just call Dan. Oh, Dan. <laughs> Dan's available. Dan, <laughs> Dan loves doing interviews. I saw him on TV. <laughs> um, oh, I had something to say and I've completely forgotten because that really tickled me. Um, Thailand. Oh, yes. Um, well, remember two years ago, I ran, I don't even remember what, how I found this, but I was in the airport going to Indonesia and I found that article that was from the Malaysian Motorcycle Federation that said... The, the Malaysian, what, the MHGB going to Sepang? I don't, well, that? I can't remember. Basically, it was, a, it was, this PR was across all Asian websites saying uh, MHGP will return, or not return, will head to Malaysia in 2023 and uh, it will be followed by Thailand to construct a double header that's affordable for teams and we're very happy to make this agreement and it never, and I don't know why it didn't go anywhere because it was far enough along where there was a PR on Asian websites with quotes from the president and everything. So maybe this is all tied together somewhat. Well, since we did our last podcast, you may have noticed that MotoGP has been bought by Liberty Media or Dawn of Sports, rather. They now have an 86% controlling stake. Uh, Liberty Media also own and run Formula One. So now they have the two biggest international motor sports series in the cars and bikes. And, you know, they've been explaining that their key areas for growth are going to be the Americas, uh, North and South, as well as Southeast Asia, where, you know, motorcycle racing, MotoGP in particular, has a very um, prosperous or a big following. 
And, you know, you have to imagine that if you're MXGP or you're in front motor racing, you need to try and tap into some of that more. I don't think we need two Indonesian rounds. Why not just create a big flagship event, try to get to Thailand, try to explore avenues in Malaysia as well. Uh, you know, it's an area of the world, I think, that sort of sports promoters are identifying as uh, ripe. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we do see more or if we don't see more GPs happening there. Remember, uh, we had the GP in Bali that was scheduled and then just disappeared forever. Like, we should do a story. We should track down these promoters and be like, did you even know you were on the MXGP calendar? Like, yeah, there's been so many random MXGP plans over the years. Like, Oman, there was due to just be gone? Uh, Iran, there was oh, going to yes. be a Grand Prix. There was also going to be one in Vietnam. Uh, but then it does seem like they're heading back to China, which is something. I remember the Iran one because I remember um, Ray Archer, our good friend, walking around the paddock going, if we're going to Iran, I'm retiring. I'm not going to Iran. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> um, which, to be fair, I'm not going to Iran either. I'm not sure. It, well, no one did. And I'm not sure anyone wants to. Um, but that can be a question for Dan. Well, we need Dan. Um, <laughs> when, when you're in trouble, call Dan. Um, exactly. Not David. David's no fun. Dan is where the party is. Um, He's like the American alter ego. Yes. You know, Dan Longo is, is the, you know, the guy everyone wants to hang out with and have motocross of nations with and stuff like that. And let's talk American GPs. But uh, yeah, David, I think, is more concerned with trying to work out how electric bikes can fit in a world championships. We'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get Mr. Luongo on this podcast and we'll say, look, to be clear, we don't really want to talk to David. Let's talk to Dan, just to, uh, <laughs> just to make him understand the direction we're going. Um, if we do do an interview with Dan and call him Dan, we may need some protection. So in that case, we should call EVS Sports, the original protective gear company. EVS has been protecting champions and riders for almost 40 years and doesn't plan to stop anytime soon. What started out as one knee brace has evolved into a full line of protective gear to help keep riders safe while they do what they love. Check out evs-sports.com to see the same protective gear that pros RJ Hampshire, Axel Hodges and Travis Pastrana wear every day. Thank you to EVS, thank you to All Balls Racing, thank you to Polisport for their continued support of the MXGP podcast show. Um, final thoughts... I had a couple, forgotten most of them. Uh, it's late, forgive me. One, I didn't mention, but I believe that Hurling switched to Air Forks before Sardinia and is much happier. Um, my eagle eyes tell me this. Uh, and there were a couple... Oh, there's two very big rumours going around the MXGP paddock that, was, that were relayed to me by multiple people. Haven't got them from a credible, credible source yet. So not going to reveal them, just in case I end up with egg on my face. But two very interesting rumours just swirling around. So stay tuned. Team, rider, or manufacturer based? Let's say one is... I'm trying to think of like a cryptic clue. This could be quite fun. Has Three is a, three is a magic number. Has the eagle gotten lost that's there we go that, that's one clue right mm. the eagle yes isn't that like something to do with trump okay i don't know maybe it's a terrible clue we <laughs> should do this every week we should do we should end on like a clue to something and then like the other the one riddle. is um um the finnish person likes mexican food <laughs> Which is a, a cryptic. I don't right. know. Okay. I don't really know what I'm. I'm uh, Adam. I think that that it's one thirty-seven a.m. <laughs> I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, and I, I believe that was all of my final thoughts. Have you got any well, Lewis, final is thoughts? It, is it? Yeah. Has it been nice having a podcast where you haven't had a world champion call you out for your race predictions? Yes. I feel like you can tell that I'm much more comfortable. Um, Hopefully and has it made you think twice about your race predictions in the future? Well, I don't want to like point blame at myself, but I do feel like I've been overly positive on this podcast. Have I even said one bad thing about anyone? I don't believe I have. 
uh, Paul's Jonas. I mean, you could be a bit more complimentary about wow. him. Wow. Some of us see it, some of us don't. Yeah, you're a bit critical of Ben Watson's starts as well. Well, it's not really... Not That's, really... Uh, telling the truth. No, not really critical of Ben Watson's starts. More... The starts of Ben Watson. No, rather. more of a beater's starts. Ah, right. Okay, um, I'm with you now. It, don't worry. The, the wheels are going to start turning on the Ben Watson needs a factory ride machine shortly um that's coming probably around round six so put that in your diary okay. we'll really get that moving a uh, bit too well, early back to at your, this point back to your rumors and good good luck with those and digging into them because i think if a couple of them do come off then it's going to be pretty sensational news so um you know i hope you're the first to break it well the the first rumor i have great contacts at that manufacturer and they're really open with me and don't um, fear me at all. So, and even the rider, great contact. So um, that'll be easy. Um, no, I, I mean, I don't think that will happen, but I could. I can definitely believe that it's a discussion. I think we're annoying the listeners and I'm the I'm almost tempted now. to and, just say it now. Yeah, well, no, save it for the next okay. show. Okay. I have um, to go and do a podcast about MotoGP. I thought you did that last night. No, it has to be done this morning. Okay, well then, everyone, you should now listen to the Paddock Pass podcast now that you have finished <laughs> this episode of the MXGP podcast show. Almost forgot the name of it, very tired. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode. MXGP is back this coming weekend. Trentino Pietra Murata. So uh, we will be Pietro back Pietra next... Murata, Luis. What did I, what did I say? <laughs> You made it sound like a pizza. It's Pietro Morata. I feel like I really went hard on the Italian spin with my pronunciation. Trying. Um, so we will be back in seven days' time with another podcast with a guest. Who knows who it will be? Um, spin the wheel, Hurlings, Rasmus, Dan. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> um, Mr. Wong is now on the uh, dock as well. Um, someone like Ben Watson would be a much more safe bet, but instead we are... We, uh, we aspire for Mr. Wong and Dan, maybe at the same time. Or maybe Mr. Aran, who knows? Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you once again to Polisport, All Balls Racing, and EVS. We will be back in seven days' time, so we will see you then. <laughs>